Getting good seismic images of the subsurface can be really tough at times, particularly when the layers in the subsurface have alternating seismic velocities or those seismic velocities vary through a profile. Rocks that have particularly high velocities compared to most sedimentary successions include basalts, so lavas and sills, and evaporites like halite. But the other way in which the velocity structure in the subsurface can be complicated is by the repetition of originally deep material into the shallow section through structural processes, thrusting. Well, in some situations, imaging is straightforward. So here's an example from offshore Nigeria. These are marine data and the seabed has a simple form and the seismic velocity simply increases with depth, tracking the gradual compaction of these sands and silts into rocks. So consequently, as the rocks compact, the seismic velocity gradually increases downwards. The effect of this change in rock property downwards is to gradually absorb more seismic energy, you lose frequency content and you lose resolution as you go downwards. So if you look at the image, the top part has high resolution and as you go down, the seismic resolution gets poorer and poorer. But this is a simple expectation where the seismic velocity increases simply down with depth. And we can represent this on a cartoon where the seismic velocity is tracked by the intensity of that green colour. But what happens if there's a higher velocity layer embedded within this general profile? Well, the types of rocks that may give rise to a high velocity layer commonly would include a thick limestone unit or a thick uh, layer of salt or evaporites or igneous rocks like basalt. Well, here's an example from the Faroe Shetland Basin and it shows a layer in the seismic image that is thought to be a layer of basalt. Above this, there's good seismic resolution, but below, there's very poor seismic resolution. So clearly, this basaltic layer is absorbing and scattering the seismic energy. Well, let's imagine that we want to image below the basalt to try and get at the rock layers and some of the structures that lie at depth. So why can't we see these on the image on the right? Well, seismic data are generally required with vertical instance and stacked in that fashion so that the energy comes straight down and back up to a receiver that is relatively close to the source. And of course, you'll get a really bouncy, prominent reflection coming off the top of our basalt layer. But some of that energy, of course, will penetrate and go into the subsurface below like this, but it won't necessarily come straight back to the receiver. It can bounce around in the subsurface between the basalt layer and a target horizon, generating multiples. These aren't like the multiples that come off the seabed, these are intrabed multiples where the seismic energy is reverberating within the rock column. It can reverberate multiple times, so you get really complicated ray paths like this where the seismic energy bounces backwards and forwards before coming back to the surface. Now the issue with this setup is that the reverberations, these multiples, will plot on top of primary reflectors below. So it may be very hard to discriminate between these primary reflectors and the multiples. And of course this reverberation process is scattering and defocusing the seismic energy. So you get a swathe where the seismic imaging is very poor. Well, what can we do about this? Well, our seismic survey includes many receivers strung out the back of our survey vessel. Let's just consider the receivers that are strung out further away from the source so that the seismic ray path has an angle that isn't a simple narrow angle but a wide angle. This generates a different set of migration strategies for the seismic energy provided we know or can estimate the seismic velocity of the rocks through which these rays are parting. The wide angle reflection coming off that uh, deeper reflector in there, the multiple for that isn't going to be picked up from this ray path because it will go off beyond the streamer. That's not to say that some multiples aren't going to be picked up, but the point of course is that these generate different migration artifacts that can be processed so it's possible to extract and remove the multiples more conveniently. And as a consequence, the image could be sharpened up like this.
so by changing the processing we can get a better image. But what happens when our high velocity layer varies in thickness, such as we can see in here from an image from the North Sea? In this particular case, our high velocity layer is provided by salt, and you can see that it varies in thickness. So how can this variable layer thickness distort our seismic image? Let's go back to our cartoon again, and here's our nice simple world with the seismic velocity simply increasing with depth. But let's now put in a high velocity layer. And this layer has a bump in it of a thickened zone, rather like we saw in that image just before. And beneath this high velocity material, we have a target horizon. Let's see what happens as we try to image this target horizon, starting first of all on the right hand side. So our seismic energy goes down with a particular velocity, gradually increasing until it hits the high velocity zone, and then it accelerates, and then it returns to normal and reaches the target horizon. And of course, repeats the same as it goes back to the Earth's surface. But let's consider the energy that's sent into the top of our dome in the middle of our image. The seismic energy will reach the top of our high velocity zone sooner than it does on the right hand side and then it will be accelerated in the high velocity zone and then go down to the target horizon. So if we compare our two ray paths in there, the one that accesses the crest of the dome has more of its ray path in the high velocity material. Therefore the seismic energy will have a shorter travel time down to our target horizon if it goes through the thicker high velocity material than if it goes through the thinner one on the right. So there's a shorter travel time to target. Therefore, if we plot this diagram not in kilometers as it's shown at the moment, but in two-way time, there's a feature like this where the target horizon and indeed the base of the high velocity layer plot higher than they do to the sides. This creates an artifact that's known as pull-up. And of course, we'll also get distortions and multiples that will dim the image beneath the thicker part of our high velocity material. So if we come back to our image from the North Sea, we can see that beneath the areas of thick salt, in this case, that the base of the salt has been pulled up. It's a distortion. The reality would have a smoother, perhaps even horizontal surface beneath this salt dome. You can also see that the image beneath the salt dome is distorted. Well, let's now move on to a thrust situation. Thrusts carry deeper rocks onto shallower ones. So if before thrusting, the size of the velocity increased with depth, the act of thrusting is to carry higher velocity material onto shallower rocks of lower seismic velocity. So let's explore this. Let's take away the color. Here is a line drawing of our thrust system. And now let's superimpose on this a velocity structure. The yellows have higher velocities than the green, and you can see that we've elevated a higher velocity package here on top of the green colors in the football. So we've got a velocity inversion, higher velocity on top of lower velocity beneath the thrust sheet. Let's just take away our line drawing to see the velocity structure, and there we have it. So what's going to be the effect of this if we come to image this profile. So again the geometry we've been looking at has had a vertical scale in kilometers. Let's put a marker horizon on here and see what happens. So there it is in our line drawing. So if we think about how this will plot in two-way time there'll be pull up because the seismic travel time will be accelerated through the higher velocity thrust sheet compared to the situation out ahead of the thrust on the right. So our image will show structures in the football that masquerade as small fold structures beneath our thrust sheet. That's pull up. Now, in the history of oil exploration, some of these structures had been drilled on the assumption they were real geology. And of course, they weren't there at all. And it's an artifact of the imaging that creates the fold, the pull up. That is our geological reality. So pull ups are bogus structures there, an artifact of the imaging in two-way time caused by heterogeneous seismic velocity structure.
Now in our simple image that we've been looking at in our cartoon in here, there are no dramatic jumps in the seismic velocity with depth apart from that caused by the thrusting. Now consequently, seismic images in these situations are unlikely to be greatly distorted. Yes, we'll get pull-up effects, but the geometry beneath the thrust sheet is likely to be still imaged. And we can see this manifest here in the deep water Niger Delta. Now these rocks here are sand, silts and muds, and the compaction state of these rocks, which will control the seismic velocity, is simply depth dependent. So consequently, the seismic velocity in here will be smoothly varying with depth, and the seismic image, therefore, is relatively simple. Compare this with this situation, which comes from onshore in the Canadian Cordillera, and you can see that, at least compared with the Niger Delta data we were just looking at, the size of the image here is pretty poor. It's quite difficult to pick thrusts and fold structures in here. And, and part of the problem here is also that these data are required on land, so you haven't got a smooth top surface in here. You've also got topography, which generates problems with seismic processing related to the local source receiver setup, problems generally referred to as statics. But the rocks here are limestones and siltstones which have alternating seismic velocities, which increases the problem of multiples, increases the scattering of the seismic energy, all of which goes to degrade the seismic image. So let's return to offshore data, and we can see how seismic images have been created and the importance of a good velocity model. So these are modern 2D data acquired from the Bandar Arc offshore Indonesia, there's a foreland area here that's coming into our thrust belt. You can see the thrust front in here, and here's the thrust system shunting over the foreland, and we can recognize the foreland continuing beneath the thrust system, and notice that the image quality in here is degraded. So there's a subthrust foreland area, but the complex structures of the thrust system above have degraded the seismic image quality as you try and look below the thrust system itself. But maybe our task is to try and trace structures from the foreland into the subthrust area, particularly if they're exploration targets in this deep subthrust play. Even though the image quality here beneath the thrust system isn't brilliant, this image is still really good for a thrust belt. CGG, the company that acquired these data and did the processing, spent a lot of time worrying about the seismic velocity structure so they could do better migrations. In 2012, this was their velocity model. The image that we've just seen was based on this seismic velocity model, which shows far more heterogeneity, far more complexity, which makes it easier to place the seismic energy back in the places from which it came from. In other words, to make a better migration to this sort of image. So that shows the importance of having a good understanding of the seismic velocity in order to make a good migration and consequently generate a good image. But onshore data are really problematic because of these static issues and in many continental thrust systems the rocks are not simply sandstones and shales but include limestones and shales and alternations of seismic velocity with depth. In the core of this anticline here you might expect to have a complicated structure all of which will scatter the seismic energy. So if the desire is to have a good crisp image of the structures in the core of this fold, we'll need to get involved with rather complicated migration of the seismic data and a good idea of the seismic velocity. Now the catch of course is to get a good idea of the seismic velocity, we have to understand the geology. So you need to iterate between the geological interpretation, the creation of a velocity model, and then generate a new seismic image on the basis of that new velocity model and the remigrated seismic records. So a brief look at the issues of heterogeneous seismic velocities and the problems in creating good seismic images in those situations. High velocity layers commonly produced as a result of having basalt or salt within the rock sequence, together with the problem of mixing up velocity layers through tectonic processes, namely thrusting. In order to get a good image, we can change the way in which the seismic data are processed, 
concentrating on wide angle rather than simple vertical incidence ray paths. The quality of the seismic migration will be enhanced by having good velocity models, but to get those velocity models we need to iterate between geological interpretation and seismic processing. And of course, we can design our seismic experiments to acquire data, for example, changing the frequency content of our seismic sources and changing the layout of sources and receivers to increase the opportunities for wide angle reflections. These issues are very much at the forefront of modern research into seismic reflection imaging.